Hey there, everyone. A warm welcome back to CBS News. I'm Errol Bonnet. And I'm Lana Zak. Here's a quick look at some of the top stories we're following right now. President Biden wrapped up his three-day trip to Eastern Europe by meeting with a group of NATO allies known as the Bucharest Nine. The meeting comes on the heels of the president delivering powerful remarks in Poland. Biden used the trip to drum up support for Ukraine almost a year to the day that Russia first launched its invasion. Plus, millions are bracing for another powerful winter storm. Forecasters are expecting the brunt of this icy weather to slam the upper Midwest. Some areas could get more than 20 inches of snow today and up to two feet in the days ahead. U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg is set to travel to East Palestine, Ohio on Thursday. His visit comes in the wake of a disastrous train derailment. Buttigieg is now admitting that the administration made several mistakes when responding to the crash. Well, some airlines are finally taking action to make it easier for parents to sit with their children. Yeah, this comes as the Biden administration and lawmakers place increasing pressure on carriers charging families to sit together on flights. United Airlines unveiled a new policy Monday allowing children under 12 to sit next to an adult in their party for free. One day later, Frontier Airlines announced children under the age of 14 will be automatically seated with at least one adult at no additional charge. Joining us now is the CEO of Frontier Airlines, Barry Biffle. Barry, thanks for being here. Uh, tell us why you've decided to unveil this policy now. When does it take effect? And do you regret that you ever charged parents to sit with their children? Well, actually, we have uh, we've been doing this since October, so it's it's actually been going on now uh, for several months uh, without any fanfare. But uh, given the recent um, kind of kind of discussion about this, we decided to announce it. But uh, yes, we put it in place uh, last October. And uh, we've been assigning 14 and under uh, with an adult in their party since that time. And it's, it's worked really well. People love it. And Frontier is kind of the airline that caters to families in the first place. And, and the kids love the animals on the tail. And so it's just <laughs> kind of a natural extension of our brand. But we, 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 don't, we don't regret doing it uh, one bit. Uh, we're, we're the best uh, value from a price perspective, but also best for families that, that want to sit together. And so, Barry, help clarify for us, how much did it cost before October? And why didn't you do this earlier? Well, so we do we do sell uh, seat assignments as an option, um, and we have those options still available to people. Um, so I don't know that it costs anything uh, to us uh, necessarily, um, other than you know I guess some people might not buy a seat assignment if they know they're going to get it for for free. Um, but you don't necessarily get to choose uh, where you seat. So if you want a window seat and and want to sit next to your child, or you want a specific area that you like to sit on on the plane. Um, some people love the front, some people love the back for different reasons. You want to, some want to be next to the lavatory, some not. Um, and some sell seat assignments, but um, I think we've always had some type of, of seating policy uh, for, for smaller children, um, and we've tried a number of different things. So this really isn't new that we've been trying to get families together. We've been doing that for, for actually uh, many years. Um, this is just now the, the latest iteration, and we think we've, we've actually kind of cracked the code on, on how to be you know, most successful at this because it, it does two scans, one at 10 days before, and then anybody who books inside 10 days, it does it again at 48 hours. It, it assigns the seats for them. So we kind of get the best of the world. So, so both worlds, you can, you can still sell uh, seat assignments to those that want it and those that don't want to buy those but want to sit with their child. We have that option too for free. Barry, uh, we appreciate you letting us grill you a bit about this. As you can tell, it touches a nerve for me and other parents who have been told that they have to pay for advanced seat assignments just to make sure that their minor children aren't sitting with strangers. Um, so I'm going to give you an opportunity, since you are a leader in this, to throw a little shade at maybe some of your competitors, because uh, I'm wondering what you would say to, uh, to the other airlines who are still charging for parents to sit together with their children. Well, I, I don't want to pick on anyone else. I mean, I know that uh, it's a difficult industry. Um, all I can say is that well, do you uh, think, think that it is wrong? Should I say that, Barry? Do you think that it is wrong for airlines to charge parents to sit with their minor children? Well, I have a he's no longer small anyone, but I have a child and we've traveled with him. And and um, and in fact, that's kind of what 
dictated how we've thought about putting families together for a long time. And, and we've, we've, we even had a family section at one point, we did the kids zone, um, it turned out to work on some flights. And then sometimes if your flight to Orlando at spring break, one little <laughs> small kids zone didn't work. And so, um, that, that's how we kind of got to where we are as we, we came up with a solution that now we're, we're looking for always that hundred percent. Um, but no, I, I would encourage airlines to figure it out, but, um, Look, you, you've got airlines that don't even offer seat assignments. I think I think there's even bigger problems. And so when you're when you're an airline that has general boarding and open seating, um, you invariably have these problems. And 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 you've probably flown on an airline that does that. And I will tell you, I, I worked at an airline once that 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 we did that. And you're at departure time, and people are arguing. And I want to sit with my child, but this this person had the exit row they wanted, or they had the 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 window they wanted and, and it, you know, invariably just, it just delays the flight. So I think it would be better if, if everybody offered it, but uh, you know, that's, that's their decision on how they run their business. All I know is that Frontier is the right airline uh, for families. And uh, I think we've shown once again, that, that, that we're not only the best value uh, from a price perspective, but we're the best from a seat perspective as well. Well, I'm All sure right. families of kids, but you know, parents of kids appreciate this news with Frontier and United apparently leading the way other airlines listen up. Barry Biffle, great to have you with us today. Thanks, Barry. Hey, good to see you guys again. Thank you. All right, physical attacks on the U.S. power grid have skyrocketed recently. Yeah, and that's right, and the uptick is expected to continue this year. According to the Electricity Information Sharing and Analysis Center, physical security incidents rose 71% last year compared to 2021. Well, let's bring in CBS News Homeland Security and Justice reporter Nicole Skanga. Hey, Nicole, tell us what's behind the increase in physical attacks to the U.S. power grid. Lana, good to be with you. Nearly 4,500 incidents tracked over the past two years, and analysts determined that an uptick in ballistic damage, incidents of intrusion or tampering, and vandalism drove this increase in serious attacks impacting the power grid last year. What does that mean? Well, according to this confidential study we obtained, officials are tracking incidents impacting power grids both inside and outside the perimeter of electrical infrastructure. Now, inside the perimeter, intrusions may incur into control houses to damage or destroy equipment, set fires, or even tamper with switches. But significant damage has also been done outside the perimeter. Attacks that run the gamut from throwing objects at electrified equipment all the way to focused ballistic attacks aimed at de-energizing some of this equipment. Viewers might remember we saw deliberate shootings last December at two substations mm -hmm. in Moore County, North Carolina. That attack turned the lights out for days for roughly 45,000 people. It's worth mentioning in that case, officials are still searching for a suspect or suspects behind that attack, as well as the motive there. You know, Nicole, what's interesting uh, when you reported information on this Friday on the stream is that while they're investigating that incident, they do have a sense of some trends and some groups which are purposefully um, trying to damage the grid. Talk to us about what the motivations are driving this uptick. Yes, Errol, multiple groups attack or attempt to go after these grid assets for different reasons. There have been, you know, economic crimes over the years, theft of copper, tools, catalytic converters. That all remains a challenge for the industry. Uh, you know, but while regulators have worried about targeting of substation for years, there's mounting concern here among industry analysts that racially motivated violent extremists, lone wolves, and radical environmentalists present an elevated threat. This potentially linked to an increase in the dissemination of specific tactics, techniques, and procedures online, particularly on platforms frequented by far-right groups. You mentioned it, you know, last week, two individuals, including a known neo-Nazi founder, indicted by a federal grand jury after allegedly plotting to attack five power substations in Maryland and Pennsylvania, an effort they hoped would lay waste to the city of Baltimore, according to court documents. And that is the kind of behavior, you know, we talked about last week, the Department of Homeland Security and FBI particularly concerned about the head of intelligence at DHS telling me they're on the lookout for copycat attacks and have not ruled out insider threats linked to some of these incidents still under investigation. Nicole, you hear this story and you're just like, what is happening with our society? So tell us, what are leaders doing, our government leaders, the, the owners of these, these power industries, 
to try and stop these threats. Yeah, Lana, it's so true. And officials at the Department of Homeland Security tell CBS they've increased communications with critical infrastructure owners and operators. You know, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, so many acronyms here, is about halfway through its study to evaluate security at U.S. power grids. You know, according to this new study, we also know that physical security incident sharing with regulators has increased. That's important to keep in mind because, you know, you alluded to this, 80 percent of the U.S. power grid is privately owned. There's no single government agency, not even the Department of Energy, charged with protecting the U.S. power grid. You know, I also spoke with a former head of infrastructure at the Department of Homeland Security uh, last night. He told me it's important to go beyond Band-Aid approaches to security. You know, mm -hmm. fencing cameras, better lighting could not have prevented some of the attacks we saw in 2021. Right. What that means is that owners and operators of the power grid are going to need to invest in resilience, adding redundancies to the system to remove a single point of failure on the grid. And, you know, when it comes to litigation, some of these cases we've seen, there are many industry experts and even lawmakers pushing for attacks on critical infrastructure to be treated as domestic terrorism in the court of law. All right. Nicole Skanga, thank you. You stay on this. Thank you. All right, existing home sales declined once again in January, and that is the 12th straight month now. That's right. It's the lowest level of existing home sales posted in more than 12 years. According to the National Association of Realtors, the pace of the decline also slowed last month. That is a trend that's being recognized nationwide. January's existing home sales fell 0.7 percent from December. It's a total decline of nearly 40 percent from the same time last year. So Veronica Dagger joins us to discuss all of it. She is a personal finance reporter for The Wall Street Journal. Veronica, welcome. So really the headline in all of this is that the slowdown is slowing down. Why are we seeing this in the housing market? Well, right now, buyers are dealing with a lot of challenges. Mortgage rates have basically doubled from what they were a year ago. In addition, we still have low levels of inventory. We have sellers who may be thinking about selling but don't want to put their home on the market because they don't want to give up their very low interest rate mortgage. As a result, we've had this tension happening in the housing market. Now we're going into spring selling season right now. Things are starting to come a little bit looser for buyers and we're starting to see that in February as this month uh, continues. So help us understand uh, then what spring will look like, because during the pandemic, you saw demand um, jump that increased prices. So now that there's still limited inventory, but high, um, you know, loan rates, what will happen? What do, where do you see that going? So more buyers are edging back into the market. They're getting a little bit more accustomed to these higher interest rates. They're still historically low if you look at the the, the whole uh, big picture of mortgage rates over history. So some people are c coming to peace with that. Um, some sellers are getting a little bit more realistic in their pricing. We're seeing some price growth decline in certain markets because sellers are realizing that, hey, maybe my neighbor got a certain price a year ago realizing I might not get that same price. And mm. so in turn, I'm going to negotiate with buyers a little bit more. Well, sellers always wonder whether or not they should update their homes before selling. Let's help them out with some news you can use right now. Given this market, what do you recommend? Well, given this market, it really depends on your local market, what's appropriate and what real estate agents are telling you. But you should know certain upgrades are going to bring you more value than others. For example, there was a National Real Estate, National Association of Realtors study not too long ago that showed upgrades like hardwood flooring or fresh insulation in a home, even a fresh paint job will give you more of a return on investment than something as more expensive as adding a new bedroom or a bathroom to a house. Hmm. So you might, these small changes might bring you more of a return as a seller than others. In addition, you want to think about your market. If you're selling a home in Florida, don't renovate your home with dark colors, wood paneling, because many Florida buyers 
appreciate the coastal look. So think about what's appropriate for your market before you invest in a renovation because people's tastes are different and your buyer may not have the same sensibilities as you. You're exactly right, Veronica. And that's why they say avoid the trendy stuff, the mm -hmm. stuff that's cool on TikTok and Instagram and all the sites. Don't worry about that. Keep it kind of, you know, classic um, because buyers exactly. have better tastes. Veronica Daga, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. We are going to take a short break. Yeah, that's a great idea. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS News Always On. Maybe you've seen this if you've gone shopping lately. Stores are finding new ways to combat the rise in shoplifting after a new survey found businesses lose $100 billion due to theft. $100 billion. Senior reporter at Axios, Kelly Tycho, joined Vlad and Anne Marie earlier to discuss the issue and how customers are responding. Vlad and I were talking about this earlier, yeah. how frustrating it is often uh, when you have to deal with these security measures because it just it's more time in the store. You got to wait for someone to to find you and help you out. How does the current state of shop of shoplifting, because I didn't know it was this bad, compare to previous years um, based on the statistics that you know? Well, thank you for so much for having me. Well, like like you said, it's about 97 percent increase compared um, in retail theft in 2021 compared to the year before, which was about $90.8 billion. And we're talking about um, everything from baby formula, um, pain medicine, um, razors, everything is so much is under lock and key, even laundry detergent, Tide Pods. Um, it depends on where you're located. I'm in um, South Florida and where I am, I see baby formula locked up with some razors, not as much as you might see in um, New York City and other parts of the country. Yeah, so the theft is um, costing retailers. It costs retailers sales from paying customers. So walk us through how retailers are actually losing money from actual shoppers. Well, it's that frustration, that inconvenience, the, the waiting for someone to unlock unlock that um, case. And so retailers are, can lose about 15 to 25% based on that. And so some um, shoppers are going online to make the same purchase, um, save some money, save some time there. And um, they're also like, look, retailers are looking for other ways. So if you add that $100 billion in theft, they're also spending a lot of money on new measures, like these locked cases, like sensors on shopping carts. There's all these different ways that they're um, looking at to stop the theft. About 98% of the customers in a store are honest customers. And there's 2% that are the bad actors that are um, possibly taking some of the items. Um, I thought it was interesting that in our lead up, we talked about organized retail theft, right? Because that's an awful lot. Mm -hmm. And when I think of shoplifting, I think of like some teenager. Right. Like, Daring you to steal a pack of gum, and, right? <laughs> totally. And then you or come like out and you're like, hey. Yeah, yeah. Did you yeah. ever take anything when you were like a little kid? You know, like yeah. you grab the lollipop and then your mom's like, what are what you are doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Um, but when you're talking about organized th theft, this is a whole other right. level. And I will tell you, when I was little, I did remember walking out of the store with a backpack, but my mom and I went right back in because it was a mistake. You know, you're right. wearing a new backpack around the store. Um, but I remember going back in and feeling very guilty over that. But um, yet, yeah, like, the thing is, is that a lot of the, um, shop, someone you might think is shoplifting, they might be part of a larger ring. That's what, um, right. that's what retailers are looking at. And we have some new laws that are, uh, new laws going into effect um, in June. Um, called the inform act which is integrity notification fairness and online retail marketplaces and what that's going to do it's going to bear um require the marketplaces to verify the third party sell sellers that are having a high volume so let's talk about some methods that retailers right. are considering I, Emory and I were, spot. Uh, yeah we were just having a discussion and i sort of i don't know if you're familiar with i, I was in an airport recently and i walked it was an overnight flight that i was taking and so there weren't a lot of retail businesses open but you walk through one of the supermarkets and you put your credit card down to get into the market, and whatever you pull off the shelf, there's no there's no humans in the shop at all. Whatever you pull off the shelf gets charged to your credit card. So I suggested to Emory mm -hmm. maybe that could work, yeah. but then she pointed out to me, Vlad, that that would be discriminatory for people who don't have cash credit cards. Only. Lots of people are cash but only. But is there a sweet spot? Well, and that's why um, they're they're testing a lot of things, like the they're testing locking the wheels of that shopping cart. If someone is trying to get out of the store without going to checkout, that's one thing that retailers are doing. There's also um, it's called Freedom Case, and what it is, it's a um, company is requires you to put a cell phone to get the co the lock to open instead of having to wait for someone to open it with a key. So there's measures like that. I was at a CVS um, in in DC and 
I thought it was interesting. Some of the cases were unlocked and like, but they had a zing and it kind of like notified you that you're yeah. being kind of, you're being watched. I've seen really that before. We open it. It's like this loud noise. So everyone knows you're getting deodorant. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a lot of different things. Uh, really <laughs> interesting. But it's true, as we've been saying, Kelly, thanks for your time. It, yeah. it, Kelly, it, the reality is that um, we have really nice things. We used to easily be able to get on a plane. We used to be able mm. to, you know, open a Tylenol bottle very easily. Yeah. Now it's like everything, bad actors, bad faith actors ruin everything for everybody. So true. Uh, thank Great. you so much for spending some time with us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Coming up, it's CBS News Primetime with John Dickerson. Millions of Americans are in the path of a severe winter storm. Ahead, John's going to be looking at the areas that are getting hit the hardest. Plus, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg is set to visit East Palestine, Ohio Thursday. What he's saying about the Biden administration's mistakes in responding to this disaster. CBS News Primetime with John Dickerson is next. You're streaming CBS News.